Just a note before we get started. This episode of True Crime Conversations contains discussions of extreme physical violence, trauma, sexual assault and adult themes. There is also the discussion of an incredibly violent act of rape. Listener discretion is advised. It was an autumn afternoon on April 22nd, 1999, when nine-year-old Kira Steinhardt left her primary school and began the short walk home. That Thursday was only the second time Kira had ever walked home on her own. With blonde hair, blue eyes and big front teeth, Kira looked like any ordinary kid navigating suburban streets in her school uniform. As she walked along a main road in the central Queensland town of Rockhampton, which lies between Townsville and Brisbane, Kira was focused on the footpath that lay ahead of her. It was then that she was struck across the back of the head and knocked to the ground. She wouldn't know it at the time, but a couple would witness what happened to Kira that afternoon. They saw the man that attacked her, a man who proceeded to do much worse. Kira would be the last in a rape and killing spree that shook Rockhampton in the late 1990s. Her death would lead police to a man they already knew, a man who is now infamously known as the Rockhampton Rapist. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations. Exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to those who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking with journalist and author Paula Donovan. Paula is a crime editor at Seven News. She has been a journalist for 27 years, specialising in investigative journalism and crime reporting. While chief police reporter for Queensland newspaper The Courier Mail... Paula covered the Leonard Fraser story from the beginning and worked closely with the team of Queensland homicide detectives, Task Force Alex. Her book, Things a Killer Would Know, recounts the life and crimes of Leonard Fraser, or, as people would come to know him, the Rockhampton Rapist. I want to begin in... April 1999, when a woman named Sylvia Marie Benedetti meets a stranger. Can you explain what unfolded in the next few hours? So Sylvia Benedetti was was 19 and she was someone whose life had become heavily dictated by uh, being sexually abused by her father as a child. So it, it sort of really consumed her a lot had meant that she was someone who was prone to mood swings. She was um, someone who had become quite erratic. She was using drugs uh, at the time, pot and amphetamines. Her relationship with her partner, who actually really did care and genuinely loved her, was breaking down. And she sort of had moved out from her flat that she was sharing with Joe and had sort of found herself wandering about the Rockhampton CBD and was. I don't know whether she was looking to score, but Fraser emerged and was someone that she had known, had met through a mutual acquaintance at Centrelink and had uh, basically knew that he was someone who could possibly get his hands on some drugs. And Fraser actually said to her, I've got some pot, uh, we can go up and smoke it in this old hotel. Now, the hotel that he took her to had been closed down and it was really dark, uh, so, so dark, in fact, that uh, police would later describe it as incredible that he was able to, to commit what he had committed there and not leave a trace of himself in the hotel itself. So he, he lured Sylvia up on the premise that he was going to give her the marijuana and he took her to room 13. And Fraser being Fraser uh, and being the opportunist and predator that he was, made a sexual overture towards Sylvia. He later confessed that he went to kiss her and she just reacted wildly and rejected him and then took a swing at him. And that just unleashed this ferocity within Fraser where he then beat her to death with a piece of timber, hitting her over the head. 
over and over again. When he realised what he had done, what did he then do with Sylvia? He panicked a little bit when he when he was trying to figure out how he was going to clean up what he had done. Basically, the uh, crime scene would later reveal blood splatters across 12 foot high ceilings. So you can just think about that for a second in terms of the ferocity at which he hit her with that timber. He tried to, in vain, to clean it up with a with a tea towel or a towel of some sort that he found, and that wasn't good enough. So he, uh, after, well, he raped her and then stripped her body and basically took her downstairs and placed her over a drain to, to, to basically bleed her corpse, which it, it just sounds so inhumane and horrific. When you think about it, as, as you would see, what happens in slaughterhouses, what happens in butchers when they're, when they're draining uh, animal carcasses, it's pretty much the, the amount of respect he showed. Sylvia's body placed her over the drain and bled her, uh, took her clothing, shoes, underwear, and placed them in a freezer, and the freezer had water at the bottom of it. So he submerged her clothing and belongings in there. I want to go back now from that scene to the childhood of a man named Leonard Fraser. What was his upbringing like? Look, he had a what you would call a normal upbringing, I guess. He was one of five children. One of his brothers died at a very young age. His mother was stay-at-home mum. His father was a World War II veteran who returned and worked as a machinist, but his work often meant that he would move a lot. So the family had to move a lot with him. And in one year, I think that they moved, I think, six times. So in that sense, Fraser, unlike his siblings, didn't cope with that. He found it very disruptive, didn't make friends easily. And I think by the time he was... 14. Uh, he had wanted to drop out of school. He, he didn't do too well at school. He couldn't concentrate. He was someone that couldn't sit still for long. His parents had found him growing up as a child that he would lie about things that he didn't need to lie about. So, you know, he'd bring an item uh, home and they'd ask him where he got it from and he would lie about the, where he'd sourced it because he usually had stolen it. Uh, so the time he was 14, he was becoming quite a, a troubled child, uh, particularly with his parents, and they couldn't quite work him out. And then when he was 15, he'd uh, dropped out of school and his parents had tried to put him to work so he could earn, earn some money because they didn't want him just roaming the streets. And his father had tried to get him to work as an apprentice machinist, and that didn't last long because Fraser had a pretty short fuse and wasn't someone who throughout his life could work very well with people. So that ended quickly, and Fraser ended up getting himself into trouble. So by the time he was 15 in 1966, he was charged with stealing a gearbox from a car with some mates of his. And his behaviour from there sort of started to escalate, and he was what his parents, he sort of became uncontrollable. They didn't really know what to do with him. They tried to get him psychiatrically assessed, and that didn't work. So the police sort of said, well, have you thought about putting him in a boys' home? And at this stage, they were living in Gosford in New South Wales. So his parents thought that might be the way to go with Fraser because his behaviour was escalating. So he just he was becoming what they would say was uncontrollable. But they always saw two sides to him and they could never quite work it out. So in some ways, he could be this kid that could lash out, lie, steal, assault people, but and also a kid that would help someone at the drop of a hat and be a good Samaritan. What sort of environment was that boys' home that he was sent to? Well, the Gossip Boys' Home, as it was later revealed, was a really brutal, punitive environment. And one of the problems there that Fraser would later refer to as homosexual affairs was a currency between older and younger boys where the older boys would rape younger boys. Not not all of them, obviously, but there was an undercurrent there where the older boys would rape the younger or the stronger would rape the weaker, and then that would sort of repeat itself. And Fraser was one of those boys who 
subsequent psychologists and people believed was, was actually rape and then learned to rape. He, he changed a lot when he came out of the Gosford Boys Home and he did two stints. The former inmates talked about the cruelty that was meted out on the boys by staff. I think one boy recounted seeing a cat, I think it was boiled or skinned alive in front of them, being beaten for, for dropping a knife or your fork at dinner time. So it was a very severe, extreme environment that would have really brutalised Fraser. And then he got involved in sort of like prostitution and working in that field. What happened there? So he basically had done two stints in Gosford, had gotten out and pretty much got into trouble straight away. Uh, he was always in trouble for, for something or other. He's someone who never wanted to follow the rules, didn't think they applied to him. And he worked in different jobs in construction, uh, had started using prescription drugs and drinking and gravitated towards King's Cross where he claimed to have worked as a sitter, uh, a lookout for some of the sex workers and what he would later describe himself as a pimp. And so was that how he was making his money at the time? Because at that point he's sort of a, a young adult. Was he living on his own? When he was in King's Cross at one point he was sharing a flat, but Fraser kind of... Uh, I think he was someone who was always an opportunist. So whatever, anything that presented itself where he could earn money, whether it was legally or illegal, he would seize the opportunity. He claimed a lot of things about having criminal connections to bikey gangs, to selling drugs. And it was always so very difficult to tell when uh, Fraser was being truthful because he was someone who went to great extremes to not reveal too much about himself and anything that he did reveal was often a lie. It was either elevating himself to a position that was high up in the criminal underworld, which was all fantasy, or it was something that would put him in a good light. In October 1972, and that's when he's about 21, Leonard spotted a woman in the Botanical Gardens who actually asked him for directions. How did he respond to her? He attacked her. He hit her and he dragged her into some nearby bushes and raped her so violently that she was unable to have children after. He had bumped into her after storming out of his flat. He had had a fight with his flatmate and was in a foul mood and this poor woman uh, who was visiting with her children and husband from France had asked him for directions. It was as, as, as simple exchange as that. And were police able to find out who this perpetrator was? Was there evidence that they could kind of trace? He'd left a a rubber thong at the scene, but that crime went unsolved until 1974 when Fraser was arrested over another rape at which he'd left his wallet and birth certificate at the scene. And he was then linked to another series of rapes around the area at that time. He had just gotten out of jail after serving a short stint for armed robbery, he was on parole, had gotten out, and while being interviewed by police uh, over that series of attacks, which he committed, I think, within 20-something days of being released from prison, he admitted to committing the rape of the French tourists at the Botanical Gardens in Sydney in 1972. And as you say, there were a number uh, between 1972 and that arrest in 1974. There was the woman who was in a dry cleaning shop in Mount Druitt. Now, she narrowly escaped, didn't she? She did narrowly escape. Some people came into the store and interrupted the attack. Fraser, not long after the attack on the French tourists, Fraser was jailed for an armed robbery and assault. So he was in jail until 1974, then got out and then committed within 22 days, I think it was, of release on parole, he committed a series of sexual attacks, including the woman at the dry cleaners. There was also the woman in Rudy Hill who he approached, and she managed to escape also, didn't she, by sort of some quick thinking? Yes, she did. She invited him basically to go back to her place. They could have sex there. And when Fraser kind of released his grip, she used that opportunity to get away from him. Because what's interesting there, and it's something that came up um, then when he did face trial uh, for these cases, is that it actually appears that he believes that these women wanted to have sex with him. Is that the understanding, that he sort of 
believed that they were almost willing participants? I think that's maybe something he possibly used to convince himself. Fraser, you know, in 1974, when he was jailed for those all those sex attacks, he was diagnosed as a psychopath by a jail psychiatrist who basically said that anything that he did was a means to an end without any thought or remorse for his victim. So whether the women wanted to have sex or, or Fraser maybe try to justify that was probably not really relevant for him. He was someone who was an opportunist with no control over his impulses. So if it was a woman in a dry cleaners, another woman possibly walking along a road by herself, then Fraser would take advantage of that to his own end and to satisfy uncontrollable urges. So after that, you know, being understood to be a psychopath and we know how difficult it is to get any sort of rape conviction. So in order for them to find their man would have been a really significant step. How long was he convicted for? So Fraser, uh, he actually represented himself at trial, which was interesting, in 1974. He was jailed for 21 years, but oddly, and something that still has never been explained to me because of federal privacy provisions, uh, he was released seven years later in 1981. Wow, seven years for those sorts of crimes. Seven years. He only served a third of his sentence, and this was also someone who had committed those rapes while on parole, three weeks out of jail, and obviously showed no regard for being rehabilitated in any way. Like Jail time obviously wasn't something that deterred him. So when he was released after just serving sort of one third of that sentence, what did he do? Did he go back to committing those acts? He returned to Queensland, went back to live with his parents, And by 1982, again, not long out, he attacked a woman at her home in Mackay and he later told her husband that he did it to prove a point that anyone could rape his missus, basically. And he was jailed for, I think it was two and a half months for that attack on that woman. Again, he was on New South Wales parole, but nothing happened. Two and Uh, and a half months. Two and a half months for attacking and assaulting that woman. It wasn't a sexual assault, it was a physical assault, but no doubt that woman would have been absolutely terrified because Fraser is someone whose mere presence was very menacing, particularly for women and children. So he then got out of jail and moved to Hayes Point to a caravan park, which is just north of Serena in central Queensland. His parents were both living there. He moved to be with them. And while there, he met a woman by the name of Pearl and quickly formed a relationship with her and became her de facto husband and stepfather to her nine-year-old son. They then moved to Mackay. Fraser got a full-time job as a settler ganger with Queensland Railway. And for the first time in his very nomadic existence, and an existence which was also largely spent behind bars, he was settled for three years. He was settled. Pearl had no idea about his past. They had a a daughter together, and Fraser appeared to be a doting dad. He became a provider. His relationship with Pearl, though, started to deteriorate, and I think that's more to do with Fraser and how he sees the world and where he fits in it. And by 1985, Fraser had gone to a beach and had been stalking a woman that used to go and collect shells uh, that she used to use in some homemade craft, had been stalking her for a few days before he attacked her and he raped her. She had actually tried to convince him to go back to her place, but he had remembered what had uh, happened in that previous attack where the woman had got away from him and... He wasn't having a bar of it. And after actually attacking this poor woman, he made her walk with him for a while and hold his hand, which just would have been horrific for her. He told her to stay on the beach and um, he then fled, went off to create an alibi, changed a license plate on his car to avoid detection. But it wasn't long before the woman was able to raise help. The detectives who were assigned to the case, when they went back and found the fellow whose property was just sort of boarded the beach there. It was a farmer who 
gave them a description of Fraser and told them that he'd actually pulled Fraser up a couple of times because Fraser kept cutting through his property to get to the beach to stalk this woman. And Fraser had said to him that he was there looking for work or wanting to go fishing but didn't sort of have a fishing rod and didn't have anything to sort of say he was looking for work and told the farmer that his name was Fraser. So they went back and started to do their homework and at one point the victim saw a file that the, one of the detectives had on, I think it was the seat of the police car, might have been the police station, and just popping out of the sleeve was a picture of a uh, mugshot of Fraser, and she just said, that's him, that's him, that's him, that's him. So then the detectives went to work, matched his semen and description, and he was then jailed for 12 years on that brutal rape of that poor young woman. And uh, you said before there was sort of a, a modus operandi for Leonard Fraser that was similar in the attacks, which which facilitated the police in being able to connect them all. What was that? Like he'd come up behind them and then he sort of had a way of restraining them, didn't he? He was what they would call like a blitz attack. He would often blindside them with a punch. And Fraser was a hundred and I think it was 181 centimetres tall, so just around just short of six foot tall. But he was very strong, very well built from labouring, and uh, always very fit. And his punch, even with men, you know, I interviewed some people he had assaulted with this king head of his. He was quite famous for, and he would literally he could lift a man off a bar stool with one punch. He was he was really strong. And he would often take that approach with women, sometimes blindsiding them from behind. But if it was in a case of, say, Beverly Lego, when she's sitting in a car rejecting his advances, he hit her side on. Julie Turner, he come up from behind and blitzed her. So she never saw him coming. Sylvia Benedetti, face to face. Kira Steinhardt, from behind. And it's just such a, such a rare crime in terms of someone being attacked, often in broad daylight by a complete stranger. That's very rare that that it occurs. I couldn't think of, of anything more terrifying than having someone come up behind you and you've got no idea what's going on. Well, someone like Fraser too, who is just remorseless, uncontrollable, a volcanic temper that it's never going to turn out well for anybody because he's, he was really violent. I mean, his whole life really, his temper was always, reactions to things were always disproportionate. Even in prison, that's how he earned the nickname Lenny the Loon because someone kicked a you know a soccer ball into his garden and he just went nuclear. He would just explode with rage. And he was almost uncontrollable in it. And I think that with the way he beat his later victims to death, even the way he raped the French tourist, like that violence was unrelenting, unforgiving. And I think for, for most of his victims, unstoppable, something that you would not have been able to stop. When I first saw Fraser, just being in the courtroom with him the morning after he abducted Kira, well, charged the abduction of Kira Steinhardt, seeing him and looking at him and just thinking that he, I think I, in the book, I, I think I described him as, it was like if you were in the, in the water coming face to face with a white pointer, like with this absolute predator. He's just this menacing presence who I, I think would scare anybody, daylight or night, any time being near, and particularly when he was in his uncontrollable rage and trying to satisfy those urges of his that he just had absolutely no control over. Yeah, you described in the book that it was like he had the eyes of a shark, which I think provided a real visual for what a predator he must have appeared to be. Absolutely. His eyes are really cold. And I think that, you know, for me, thinking about Kira Steinhardt being nine years old, having the freedom that every child, anyone should have to walk home safely from school, something that she had earned from her parents after her ninth birthday um, and being safe in that. And when I looked at him and saw him for the first time and just thought that that was most likely the last thing that poor girl saw. And my blood just went cold. Like I just, it just made me feel sick. The the horror of that. Never, never, well, it still doesn't leave. I can still think about that now and it puts the hair on the back of my neck up. Um, it's still something that his, the, the look in his eyes and the way he holds himself, that will never, never leave me. There's a photo that's used a lot of Fraser 
it's in my book, it's, it's all online, but it's the one of him standing as in shorts mm. and a striped shirt, and he's just standing there looking at the police camera. That was taken six hours after he took Kira, that he raped and he murdered her. And when you look at the, at the back shot of that picture, you will see how pumped his arms are. Mm. And that just reinforced to me what a heartless predator he was. And even though it was known that he was a predator, that a psychiatrist in court had found that this was a man who was beyond rehabilitation, he was in prison for those 12 years and then it was the late 1990s, I believe, where he was out in public yet again. Well, that's the interesting thing, though. When you go back, so when he was arrested for the rape in 1985, at the end of his sentence, New South Wales policy back then was not to retrieve parolees. So he actually could have been returned to New South Wales to serve the remaining 14 years of that 21-year sentence that he should have completed Mm. but never did. But they didn't have the practice or policy in place to extradite him. All through his time at the Rockhampton Correctional Centre, he threatened staff, he told many lies, I think, to different psychiatrists and psychologists. His erratic behaviour, his standover nature, he was repeatedly refused for parole because anyone who assessed him deemed him an unacceptable risk to the community, someone who would re-offend. Some predicted he would kill because of that temper that he had, because of how he saw himself, his disregard for women. And even, and this is the irony in part, with his time in the Capricorn Correctional Centre at Rockhampton was that the parole board kept saying, don't let him out, don't let him out. But within the prison, he was let into the residential section where it was a very relaxed environment. So Fraser was driving a car, never held a driver's licence either, it was helping out at schools, was working with Lions, was working with the Endeavour Foundation, was doing a lot of things, being caught going off-site, caught going to a woman's house whose lawn he mowed. He just mowed their lawn one day, off-premise, off the jail perimeter, mowed the lawn while he was supposed to be attending to an annual agricultural event that he loved working as a, a um, field fest. And then a few days later, turned up by himself to try and asked the woman for a cup of coffee. Of course, she freaked out and called authorities when she realised he was a prisoner. But mm. there was nothing that the prison staff could do. There was nothing in legislation like we have now that can delay the release of such a dangerous predator. Because while in prison, wasn't he sending, or a woman was sending letters to him who he later had a relationship with? He almost married, actually, a woman that he had met. There was a woman uh, by the name of Betty Cutty, who was the mother of a prisoner, that he was going to marry, but then he was denied parole, so that ended. He then started another pen power relationship with a woman called Marie Chivers, who was a local in Yapoon, lovely woman. Around that time that she'd met Fraser, she was diagnosed with cancer. And when Fraser got out, being Fraser, he moved in quickly with her. But that, like most of Fraser's relationships, became troubled very quickly. Uh, He became more violent to the point where she was turning up with bruises on her. Her family was starting to become very concerned. Mother Vera said that she confronted Fraser outside Woolworth one day that about him physically harming Marie. And Fraser basically said to her, if we weren't standing here outside a shopping centre, I'd slit your throat, which terrified mm. Vera. Marie had told people if anything had happened to her other than her dying of natural causes, as in the cancer, they would look at Fraser, that, he, that she believed at some point he would kill her. She actually moved from central Queensland down for treatment at a Brisbane hospital and Fraser was very angry about that. He followed her down at one point, took her to a chapel on the hospital ground and raped her in that chapel and Marie died two weeks later but not before telling a social worker and her mother about what Fraser had done to her. And they were the last weeks of her life that she had to spend under that, under those conditions. It's just horrific. Uh, I wanted to talk about the murder of Kira Steinhardt, which you've referred to. And that was, I mean, the the atrocities that that man had committed. But when we know that he'd been in the prison system, that we knew what 
he was capable of. It just, I think that that crime in particular feels so preventable. So did she go missing? Was that the first step and then everyone was, was looking for her? What happened was there was a family who witnessed Kira's abduction, assault and most likely rape that all played out in front of them about two or three hundred metres from their home. They had seen Fraser the day before, so on the 21st of April 1999, they had seen Fraser walking sort of behind Kira. So then the next day, they see him again. She walks into the vacant allotment, which a lot of the kids from the Berserker Primary School would use as a shortcut home. And it's sort of long grass kind of either side on a bit of cement. I think it was a cement or it was a dirt path. I can't remember now. I think it was a dirt path. And they were out the front of the, on their veranda and they saw Fraser come up behind Kira and punch her really hard. She went down. They then saw him moving up and down on top of her in the long grass. They couldn't see her, but they could see Fraser moving up and down, which, which you could draw from that he was raping her. This is a nine-year-old schoolgirl. He then moved her body to one side of the track, moved moved her school bag, ran, went and got his car, brought the car back onto the allotment and placed Kira's body in the boot of his car. By memory, he left her shoe and port, I think, were, were still at the scene when police turned up there later. So the family watched all this unfold and... This is about 3.40 p.m. on April 22nd, and then after discussion amongst themselves, they didn't know what to do, they said, and then uh, the the woman, uh, Mrs. Cannon, she rang a friend to get some advice about what to do. The friend wasn't home, so they then decided at 4.13 p.m., so that, what, 33 minutes later, they made an anonymous phone call to Triple O and told police what had happened. So... It's not often in a child abduction that you actually see that play out, that graphic, horrific series of actions that Fraser inflicted on Kira. So then that kicked off the police investigation. There was a a media release, I think at around 6 o'clock or so. Police were sort of, you know, swung into action really quickly to sort of find out what was happening. They identified Kira through the belongings that were left at the scene. And by then, they were trying to track down her parents, who were oblivious. They had no idea. They thought their daughter, you know, would be home safely, like every family should be feeling and and having and experiencing. The Keenan family were interviewed by police. They gave details of what, what Fraser was wearing, details of the car. So by the time... The police put out uh, it on the local news. A prison officer who knew Fraser from from the jail had seen Fraser at the school that day, and uh, obviously wearing the same clothes. Told them that he was driving a red, I think it was a red Mazda. So things started to really move. Kira's parents were contacted. They were found. Fraser was uh, kind of in the meantime driving all over a race course on the north side of Rockhampton along the banks of the Fitzroy. I think, to act as a red herring, to sort of, he, he kind of made himself known. He, you know, he flipped his finger up at a jockey and he kind of drove erratically and did a couple of burnouts. And by the time the police had turned up to talk to Kerry's parents, he was driving about 15 minutes out of Rockhampton to dump Kerry's body in bushland. After committing some pretty atrocious acts on her, he uh, later confessed to, I think, suffocating, strangling, and then cutting her throat. And then by about 9.30, they had Fraser's details in hand, knew that they had a serial rapist from two states, turned up at his house. Fraser had just finished having sex with his de facto wife, Chrissy Wright, who was a woman with serious intellectual disabilities. She was oblivious. She'd been in the car at some point with Fraser and saw what she described as a blonde-haired doll in the boot of the car. She didn't really know what was going on. Chrissy's disabilities were such that she could only actually tell time by TV programming. She couldn't actually tell time, so that might give you some insight. Fraser was picked up and taken, uh, was arrested and charged, I think it was with abduction and child stealing at that point. And in, I think the sentencing was in uh, 2000, and yeah. there were more sort of um, 
more came out during the trial. There's been talk that there were then other victims. So, example, for example, we started with uh, Sylvia. Was this when it was discovered that she had also been a victim of Leonard Fraser? It was actually earlier than that. So, Fraser, unbeknown to anyone, had murdered Sylvia on the Sunday night before he took Kira. So, on the 18th of April, he murdered Sylvia Benedetti. And then on the day before he murdered Kira, he learned that the hotel was going to be demolished, panicked, and moved her body and took her body to the Yapoon area where she went undetected to her remains. We found about 18 months later by some surfers. No one knew about it at that stage. There had been reports of disappearing of disappearances. Homicide had actually moved up there to investigate the disappearances of Julie Turner and Beverly Lego and Natasha Ryan. And Natasha had gone missing in September 1998 amid a whole raft of things like two suicide attempts, pregnancy claims, running off with a sister's boyfriend, uh, all sorts of dysfunction going on in her in her life as, as, as she was such a young girl. Then Julie Turner went missing in December 98, and then Beverly Lego went missing in March 1999. So about a month before Kira's murder. Homicide had gone up to, they were already up there investigating, but they were actually starting to look more closely at the possible links between their disappearances. All three basically had disappeared within the Rockhampton CBD within several hundred metres of each other. The commonality basically of victims of circumstances, some sort of dysfunction or vulnerability by broken family, home life, domestic violence, drug use, alcohol. Beverly and Julie were very, very similar in build. Uh, in age, they were in their late 30s. Both were in violent relationships. Again, the irony being that uh, I think they thought that Fraser was a was a good bloke that was going to sort of help them. They're, they're good Samaritan. They're you know they're guardian angel, so to speak. And so there were the disappearances that were already being looked at, and there was a lot of conjecture over what had happened to Natasha, whether Scott Black had been hiding her, which had happened before he'd been charged with that. And at that point, Fraser wasn't on the map for the police then because the circumstances for those three women were that Scott Black was the main suspect for Natasha Ryan, either hiding her or knew something what had happened to her. Then Julie Turner was in a very violent relationship and they were looking at her partner as being responsible for her disappearance. Beverly Lego had schizophrenia, drug afflicted and obviously very vulnerable by what all that entails. She was in a violent relationship that she had left, but they didn't know whether her then partner had anything to do with her disappearance. So Fraser wasn't even being sort of on the radar then because the circumstances of their lives at the times of the disappearances warranted a, a bit more of a, a looking within their own scope of their own actual lives and the immediacy of their relationships as opposed to someone like Fraser. So the day before, he moves Sylvia's body, then he takes Kira on that Thursday. Uh, in the middle of all the, the frantic search for Kira's body, on the Friday, the demolitionist comes along to take down the Queensland Hotel, but walks in and sees this horrific crime scene, like sees blood everywhere on walls, on ceilings. Oh, my God, hang on, I need to call the police. So calls the police in, and at first... One of the police attending said, oh, no, no, just a couple of homeless guys that have had, you know, had a bit of a fight. But then one of the scenes of crimes, when they sort of, because it was so dark in that hotel, it was like pitch black. The scenes of crime guys could see that the blood splatters had gone all the way up in 12 foot high ceilings and they found part of Sylvia's jaw wedged in the carpet. So at that point, they didn't know who that scene belonged to, but they knew that a pretty brutal murder had taken place. So in, in the course of the investigation of Kira, police just don't have a really hard look at Fraser, who had really deliberately stayed off the police radar. Like, he was unlicensed, so he'd never drive his car into the CBD. He would park a distance and he would walk in. The only kind of thing that he was in trouble for was domestic violence with Chrissy, but because of Chrissy's intellectual disabilities, he was able to often manipulate her into withdrawing her complaints or lying about her complaints. Like, he busted a lip, he threw her off a balcony, he would punch her... Uh, he would lock her up. He would force her to have sex. He would have raped her uh, within their own relationship. So he was someone who really wasn't on the police radar at that point. But in the course of the forensic examination of Fraser's car, they found another sample of blood in the boot. 
because he put Sylvia's body in there the day before he took Kira, and Sylvia's head had hit the boot hinge. They also found some blood on some Tally Ho papers. He was a chronic smoker addicted to Rollie, so they found some blood on a Tally Ho paper. So as the police then started to suspect more about Fraser, they started to try to find common denominators with Kira. Kira's murder basically revealed him to be a serial killer. I mean, she paid a horrific price for that to happen, but the police started to find some common denominators. Fraser worked at the same meatworks as Julie Turner. Mm. Fraser stayed at the same hostel as Beverly Lego. Fraser had served time with Beverly Lego's de facto, Richard Gritt. Fraser attended the same bowling alley where Natasha Ryan frequented every Friday night. Chrissy bowled there with the Endeavour Foundation. Fraser was always working in the lanes and Jenny Ryan worked there. Before Fraser's final time to be charged on May 6th with the murder of Kira, once he was confronted with all of the forensic information, Jenny Ryan was called down to the police station and shown a photo board and she picked out Leonard John Fraser, number four on that photo board. She picked him out and identified him as a man that used to lurk and hang around the bowling alley where Natasha went nearly every Friday night. So all these common denominators were starting to gel and come forward. Fraser then is charged with Kira's murder. He goes inside. He goes into Morton Prison, which is a prison for sex offenders, which and Fraser could not stand being amongst sex offenders because he was always so spoken out about sex offenders and pedophiles. He hated them. He'd never harm children, he would always say. And he bumped into a man by the name of Alan Quinn, the convicted fraudster, who he knew from New South Wales prison in the 1970s. They both served time at Parramatta Jail. When Fraser was in, I think, for arm um, robbery at that point when he'd met Quinn. So Quinn was there on protection as he was a crown witness for another police case. And I think Quinn had kind of wanted to redeem himself because a lot of his fraud had caused a great lot of heartache amongst his victims, including some who took their lives because they lost their life savings through his scams. So he had started collecting some evidence in 1999 about the different women that Fraser was associated with and had taken it to a detective who had been handling him as his informant for this other case and who had actually charged him with the, and convicted him of the fraud. So there was some information that was starting to come out, but of course, police are always very sceptical of prisoners coming forward with information because it's always like, well, what's in it for you? Mm. you know, and how do we know that Fraser's not you know, leading you up the garden path? Because that's what Fraser used to do. He was actually quite expert at it. And you know, Quinn was also taking a huge risk, massive risk. But those conversations between... Fraser and Quinn about these women in 1999 were quite short-lived because in November that year, the police charged him with Benedetti, Sylvia Benedetti's murder, because when they got all the DNA from families, as they naturally do for missing persons, they got it from her mother, Marie Hadfield. They brought in DNA. They had menstrual blood uh, that they found on some of Sylvia's underwear and had matched it and matched it to the blood found in Fraser's car on the cigarette paper on the boot hinge, um, on some of the trim of the car, as well as the blood that was found in room 13 in the Queensland Hotel. That shut Fraser down, and he no longer spoke to him, or didn't speak to Quinn, wouldn't speak to Quinn for another 11 months. And then in that next year, he was convicted of Kira's murder. And what was his sentence? He got an indefinite life sentence for Kira. Right. And then subsequently three indefinite life sentences for the manslaughter of Julie Turner, the murder of Sylvia Benedetti and the murder of Beverly Lego. Having studied the cases as closely as you have, what do you think can be learned from the case of Leonard Fraser? Why is it an important one that we kind of, you know, keep in the in the public consciousness? I wanted to know, the night that Kira was taken, I remember speaking to a couple of different police officers and I said, who is this guy? And, I, and, and one said to me, he's a real bad bastard, Paul. I said, didn't even, didn't even know he was here. It wasn't on our radar. And Fraser had led, you know, this fragmented nomadic existence, falling through cracks, but then falling on his feet through lax custodial sentences, walking out on parole, you know, not serving his time, and then reoffending while on parole and consistently and repeatedly proving he was a risk to the community 
but no one taking action to try and shut that down in terms of like the New South Wales authorities, for instance. So for people like Fraser, I think for me it was about that those offenders who deliberately stay off the radar but take advantage of the flaws within the criminal justice system, the ones that escalate and who cause so much carnage and damage to people's lives, like what Fraser's done to the people he has raped, and, and there's more. Like, he has raped at least 20 women. We put them up to about 50, I think, with the amount of unreported sex attacks because uh, he preyed a lot on women with intellectual disabilities and children. But I think the, the importance of people like Fraser is not letting them fall through the cracks, holding them to account when they offend on parole, bringing them back into the system, making them serve their time, not giving them a free get-out-of-jail card to go and cause carnage in the community. There was a few opportunities there where he could have been brought back and held account and the context and seriousness of his offending would have been something that would have attracted attention, the proper attention to then categorise him and deem him as the risk that he was. So if he'd been brought back to New South Wales and served that extra 14 years jail, have a think about that. Exactly right. Lives would have been saved. And I I just think that's such an important lesson uh, when it comes to offenders like these that are just going to do it again and again and just seem to be um, unable to rehabilitate. And that's what I think this story is, you know, really teaches us. So thank you so much for all your work in reporting this case and thank you for talking to us today. Thanks so much for having me. You can find Paula Donovan's book, Things a Killer Would Know, The True Story of Leonard Fraser, online at all good bookstores and via the link in the description of this episode. Before I go, I just wanted to note that if any content from this episode has raised issues for you, you can reach out at any time, day or night, to 1-800-RESPECT. That's 1-800-737-732. For photos, maps and any extra reading on this case, you can follow the link that's in the description of this episode. You can also join our closed Facebook group for any more information about the podcast. Just search True Crime Conversations on Facebook. You can also contact the show by emailing truecrime at mamamia.com.au. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper.